from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for Inside Appalachia is provided by Catholic Charities West Virginia, working to reduce poverty in West Virginia and active in long-term disaster recovery. Online at www.catholiccharitieswv.org. Goodwill Industries of Kanawha Valley. You donate. We train. Lives change. More at goodwillkv.com. Welcome inside Appalachia. In June 2016, floodwaters ravaged parts of West Virginia. 44 of the state's 55 counties were in a state of emergency, and 12 counties were declared federal disaster areas. Water carved a path of destruction unseen in generations, earning the title of the 1,000-year flood. 23 deaths were attributed to the flood. On this program, we'll share stories of recovery from some of the 12 counties that were declared federal disaster areas. Things will never be the same for these families, nor the communities. But West Virginia has come a long way since the flood. And I think we've made great progress, but understand that there were over 9,000 applications for FEMA assistance uh, as we hit the height of this thing. So this is not something we're going to fix uh, uh, in one year, much less two years, and then throw in on top of that rebuilding schools. Even though it's been one year, several families and communities still have a long way to go in both physical and mental recovery. Raynell native Keith Thompson lost his father Edward in the flood. His father and mother were in floodwaters for several hours. Edward died from hypothermia. He was a United States Army veteran. His story hits close to home for Major General James Hoyer of the West Virginia National Guard. Here's a, a guy that survived World War II, but didn't survive the flood, his expectation of the Guard and the military folks would be that we do the same thing that they did during World War II, and that is get the mission done. The work isn't just the physical rebuilding process. It's also the emotional process of recovering after the trauma. For Keith Thompson, the flood was just the beginning of his heartaches over the past year. My mom and dad were in this room for, in water, 30 some inches deep for five hours, maybe five and a half hours before they finally got out of here. My dad passed away right here. I mean, he, this is where my dad took his last breath. And many times my mother had said to me, because my dad had Alzheimer's, Many times my mother said to me that I want to live one day longer than your dad because nobody will take care of him like I did. And to the last breath of that man's body, she did. The days after the flood were somewhat of a blur for Keith. We were so busy that, you know, you didn't have time to, you didn't have time to think about it. Uh, you know, it took 11 days to get my dad buried. Uh, and in that time frame, I mean, you know, we, this place was ripped apart and there was 15, 20 feet piles of furniture and drywall and everything that was in here basically piled up in the front yard. And you know, you're so busy and there's so many people that are in and out and so many people coming by. You know, just the sheer number of people that came by to help. You know, I walked in here one day and there was about 15 people in this house and I didn't know the first one of them. I, I, you know, they just showed up. What can we do to help? It restores your faith in humanity. And through all of this mess that hit this little town and all the other areas, and I think a lot of people will say the same thing. This state and the people that, that are from around here, we still care a lot for each other. You know, I mean, we may have fought our own wars, but, but we still, you know, people still care for each other. Keith wanted the house restored for his mother, Gerda. He remembers watching her sit in the driveway as almost 50 years worth of her items were thrown out. I said, you know, and mom was sitting over there in that, in that white wicker chair underneath the, underneath the carport. And I said, if that lady right there can spend one night in this house, it's all worth it. And she did. She was here for about a month. She liked it. It was home. And I think all in all, she liked how, how everything turned out. My mother 
left this earth peacefully at about 10 minutes after 9 on October 28th. And I was called a football game. And, uh, which I thought was appropriate. You know, I wasn't with her, but she heard it. Because a wonderful nurse up there named Nikki took her cell phone and put it in my mother's room and turned on the stream. And the last thing was, was me calling the game. I know what it's like to be alone. I mean, you, you can have a husband, you can have a wife, you can have children, but until you do not have a parent, you do not know what it's like to be on this earth alone by yourself. Keith says he not only lost both of his parents, but he also lost his biggest supporters. They were proud to hear their son on the radio. Man, it dawned on me that, yeah, they're not here. They're not listening to this one. But you know, you just, you just go on and do your job and, and do the, you know, to the best of your ability. So for Keith, this past year meant saying goodbye to his father and his mother, and now his childhood home. His parents' house is up for sale. The radio they used to listen to remains in an almost brand new kitchen, along with Gerda's white wicker chair, where she sat when we first met her. But Keith says the place just isn't a home without his parents. The Thompsons' home was one of hundreds that were damaged in Greenbrier County. About 30 of those have been renovated with the help of volunteer groups. Musician and preacher John Wyatt was one of those who escaped the floodwaters but lost everything, including years of recorded oral histories. We heard from him last year right after the flood. You might remember his original song about the events of June 23rd. Muddy water, muddy water. Muddy waters flood our land. Children crying, people dying. Lord, please help us understand. When we talked to him, he shared his concerns for his community, but he didn't really mention his own troubles. Roxy Todd checked in with John to see how he's doing one year later. This is a house where the couple moved back into that lost her baby. Reverend John Wyatt just completed renovations on his home in Raynell, thanks to volunteer workers with the Faith-Based Appalachian Service Project. Come in, Roxy, into my new home, in my new house. Since the flood, he's been renting a house outside of town. He shows me around his old home, which has taken months to rebuild but he still can't shake the memories of that tragic night when he joined the rescue operations, paddling a rescue boat and saving people who were trapped in the floodwaters. Come and help us, come and help us, came the crowd. As time goes on, we're struggling to get through the after effects of what took place during the flood. You were filming me then and, and I was talking about how I could hear those cries of the people in, in the dark. Sadly, many died in Raynell on June 23rd. Many of them were John's friends and neighbors. And for weeks and weeks, you know, that was, that was something that I, you know, I'd wake in the middle of the night and I would, I would think about that. This past year, he's been so busy working on his home and volunteering to help other people. He hasn't had a lot of energy to do the things he used to do, like play music, or sit on his back porch and relax over a cup of coffee. John isn't the only one who's trying to get back to normal. Over 120 homeowners in Raynell have applied to FEMA for help demolishing their damaged homes. That's a huge loss for a community with just under 1,500 people. It's a little frightening to look at our town and I've lived here all my life and I know where each person lived and so many of them and those houses are gone now and I'm the only house left in this entire block and all the other homes, uh, seven, eight, eight of them are gone. Across town from John Wyatt, 
Sharon G. Martin has just moved into a small one-bedroom apartment. She lost her home in the flood, and she's been living the past year with family. Today, a volunteer is bringing her a new donated mattress and a box spring. Dave Lumpston is the chairman of the Greater Greenbrier Long-Term Recovery Committee, a local organization that helps coordinate resources to help flood victims. We have case managers that uh, essentially accompany a family on their journey to recovery. We connect dots. We connect need with relief agencies, government agencies, and also through our nonprofit partners. So many groups have come in over the last year to uh, help us. There we go. Oh, that's perfect. I've always been a positive thinker, so I always have faith and hope for the best. And things are falling in place, and I'm getting, I'm happy. You know, it's better now, and it's going to get better. Sharon has been waiting to get an apartment for the past 10 months while she stayed with her daughter. Others had to leave right now, or West Virginia, to try to settle someplace new. Yeah, I pastor a small church outside of Raynell, and we're down to just bare minimum now because we were a small church before the flood. We're a really small church now since the flood because we've had people who just had to move away. Raynell was struggling economically before the flood. With the decline in the timber industry, most jobs here have disappeared over John's lifetime. But there's a positive change in the air too, something he hasn't seen in decades. I do see something happening that, that wasn't happening before the flood. I see people working together, and I see a community coming together. Thousands of volunteers have poured into Raynell this past year, most of them from out of state. That spirit of volunteering that people have brought into our community, I think that's helped us too because it's reinvigorated people themselves to get back into doing something that helps others and that's benefit to others and not just to ourselves. Not only did they come in and hang sheetrock and, and paint houses and do all the work that they've done, but they brought hope to people again. It's a song, a sign of the weary. Hard times, hard times come again no more. There are still some families across the state that don't have a place to live because their homes were washed away or completely demolished. Volunteer groups from across the country have donated money, time, and supplies to make repairs and, in some cases, build entirely new homes. The Mennonites have been working to build several homes across the state, including in Clendenin. Ashton Marr reports. I know it was raining hard when I came up interstate. Richard Wolf lived in a small home on Coons Avenue in Clendenin for more than 70 years when it was flooded during severe storms in June of last year. He was in Charleston the evening of June 23rd when the rain began. And I got off the interstate and said, park and ride, water was covering over park and ride. And I turned around and went back to Charleston. I knew I couldn't get in Charleston in Clendenin. That was on Thursday. It was Sunday before Wolf was able to return to his home, where he well, says... Everything was just hop, hippy hop, everything turned over inside the house. Wolf's home was destroyed and later torn down. But after living with his sister for almost a year now, Wolf will soon return to Clendenin, this time to live in a brand new home. A crew of six Mennonite men have started to build a new one for him on Coons Avenue. There's been a steady flow of Mennonite volunteers in the areas impacted by the storm since the flooding last year. Mennonite Disaster Service estimates more than 500 volunteers have traveled to West Virginia, working in communities throughout the affected area. Ori Lehman brought this small group of volunteers from Indiana last month to work in Clendenin. We'd like to bring in about 20 people, young people and adults, and uh, work and try to build the whole house in a little more than a week maybe. Layman says the crew begins by laying the foundation. Twelve rows of concrete block will ensure that Wolf's new home will sit above the floodplain. 
Wolf's home is one of 10 being built in Clendenin through a project coordinated by the West Virginia Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster, or West Virginia VOAD. Families participating in the project are asked to use any funding they receive from the Federal Emergency Management Agency to help pay for their new home. But VOAD rallied help from several nonprofit groups from across the state to cover the remaining costs not covered by FEMA awards. The flood victims who receive new homes through the project, like Wolf, will own them outright after construction is complete, thanks to the coordination of efforts. One person cannot do it all. It, it takes everybody. I may have the funding that I can put on the table, but without someone, do an organization doing the case management or another organization such as Mennonite Disaster Service to build the home, then my funding is not going to go as far. So by, by all of us coming together and working together, we're able to stretch our dollars and we're able to accomplish a lot more. Ganaway and representatives of the other voluntary agencies involved in funding the homes broke ground on the project in front of Wolf's property in May. She says symbolizing a milestone on Clendenin's path to revitalization. For Inside Appalachia, I'm Ashton Mara in Clendenin. Clendenin isn't alone. Without volunteers, communities across the state wouldn't have made as much recovery progress. But it hasn't been easy to manage the quantity of volunteers and donations, especially in the days following the flood. There was so much donated that emergency management had a tough time finding a place to store the items. Social media also proved to be both a blessing and a curse after there was miscommunication online about where and when to get help and supplies. Heather Foster is with Volunteer West Virginia, the state's commission for national and community service. It's an agency that helps mobilize volunteers and resources for those in need. Foster says she and her team learned some things this year, including the challenges of social media. Um, I think using Twitter and Facebook um, and Instagram and all of the new you know, social media tools, um, that's where we have to be at. Um, when we think about disaster response. And so with volunteers, we're certainly looking at ways um, as part of our corrective action planning to mobilize volunteers using apps and you know new tools that will help us better manage the flow of people coming in to help. Many families lost everything, their homes, their belongings, their livelihoods, and collectively some of those communities even lost their school buildings. The West Virginia Department of Education reported 27 public school buildings suffered flood damage and five were closed. The school board in Nicholas County proposed to consolidate several schools, including Richwood Middle and Richwood High School. The plan has been met with passionate opposition from residents, and the state board recently rejected the idea to consolidate. But despite the consolidation debate, students and teachers completed a successful school year. So how did they adjust? Liz McCormick has the story. For the 2016-2017 school year, the students at Richwood Middle and High School attended classes at temporary locations. Richwood High spent the year at former Beaver Elementary School in Craigsville, located almost 30 minutes from the high school. Recent graduate Kendra Amick says it was disheartening to learn she wouldn't be in her old building for her senior year. It was hard. I mean, when they told me over the summer that the school was flooded and that we weren't going to be going back there, it was really heartbreaking, and I don't think any of us really believed it. But um, being thrown in brief fever was kind of rough. The teachers made sure that it was more like a home environment, but I know all of us would just much rather be back up at Richwood and where we all belong. Despite the change of location, Amick remained committed to her high school band, also known as the Lumberjack Express. Throughout the year, the band had to scavenge for places to practice. But when it came time for the annual festivals and parades, there was no doubt the community could rely on the Lumberjack Express to show up. During this year's spring concert, Amick performed in the marching band for the last time. Well, the community of Richwood really loves the band. Um, that's one of the cornerstones of our town, is seeing us march down every fall in orange, and we always have an annual Christmas concert, as well as a spring concert. So to get the community back together, rain or shine today, it's really nice to see everyone come out, get to hear the band, and have a little bit of hope. The Lumberjack Express is a staple of the town, says Richwood Middle School Principal Gene Collins. It's not just the high school's band, it is the community's band. Collins says the Lumberjack Express played a big role in helping students and the community to cope with the change. While traditions had to be compromised and the stability of the community was disrupted, the Lumberjack Express provided a familiar tone 
that helped the town hold on to its identity and perhaps hold on to the spirit of Richwood. Everything we do, we have a huge turnout. We have so much support. People are trying to make sure that we survive. Uh, and let's face it, in the mountains, that's what everything is about. It is about survival. They want the best for their kids, but we're also fighting for our culture to survive. For Inside Appalachia, I'm Liz McCormick. That community spirit and school pride shined bright across the state this past year. In fact, Herbert Hoover High School was another building that was closed after the flood. But despite not having a home gym, the Huskies made it to the state high school basketball tournament for the first time ever. Now that's something to be proud of. Dr. Carol Smith is a professor of counseling at Marshall University. We've talked some about the physical efforts to rebuild, but Smith points out that's just the beginning. When a traumatic event happens in a person's life, um, frequently what happens is they spend a great deal of energy at the beginning simply coping with the events as they're unfolding in front of them. They worry about safety and about provisions and about getting baseline needs met. Food, shelter, air, clothing, warmth, all of those things. And that takes a great deal of energy. But then the enormity of what actually happened and how life-changing it was actually begins to sink in for the people who are the uh, immediate survivors or even first responders. In the days and weeks after the flood, the words West Virginia Strong rang out on signs and across social media. But Dr. Smith says if you're having a hard time coping, even to this day, it doesn't mean you're weak. It means you're human. Our culture tells us we're never supposed to be sad. Our culture tells us that all things work out and they lived happily ever after. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to cry over these things because they are hurtful and they are painful. And it's okay to take a breath and say, but I'm still here and I still have these people and these things and these memories and these strengths in my life and I can take those and reinvest them in my life from this point forward. And I, from what I've heard from people who have dealt with this event firsthand, one of the things they've learned from it is, is that the community has come together much, much more and people are much more willing to help one another and to make eye contact and to be supportive. And in some ways it's in a weird way, it's kind of wiped out the community and built the community at the same time. And that's okay too, that's a beautiful thing. And so if you, can, if you can look for the good things in it, that is what you should spend your energy on. I hate to use the word should, but if you can find ways to focus on the positive things, that is to everybody's benefit. From a guard perspective, we were uh, blessed to have an exceptionally strong chaplain corps. Uh, we do have uh, psychological uh, health uh, providers that work with us, you know, whether it's related to PTSD. And, and PTSD from a combat situation and PTSD from a recovery situation, uh, they can have the same level of impact. It may just be for diff from different reasons, but uh, I'll take, for example, the first responders who, you know, we spent a great deal of time to ensure that we found that last individual of the 23 who happened to be a 14-year-old young lady from Greenbrier County. Those individuals that two weeks into this process that found her are going to be profoundly impacted for the rest of their lives. So you got to make sure that you're managing the mental health piece of this for the for not just the people, but for the first responders. Despite the challenges, Major General Hoyer says he's committed to keep his folks in the communities until recovery is complete. We owe it to the people who lost their lives and the people who were impacted by this to do it right and do it effectively and to do it in a way that we are a better state and we are better communities than before the flood happened. And as, as you know, 
We're dealing with communities that were severely impacted by the economic uh, restructuring that this state's going through, and then they got this thrown on top of them. So we owe it to those people and to those, particularly those that lost their lives, to make sure we do this and we look to what we want to be 15 years from now, not what we were 30 years ago. It's been a trying year. As long as we stand together, we can move forward. We carry with us lessons from our past and hope for our future. Thank you for joining us Inside Appalachia. Support for Inside Appalachia is provided by Catholic Charities West Virginia, working to reduce poverty in West Virginia and active in long-term disaster recovery. Online at www.catholiccharitieswv.org. Goodwill Industries of Kanawha Valley. You donate. We train. Lives change. More at goodwillkv.com. You can find more information and updates on flood recovery on our website at wvpublic.org. You can also find more on the weekly Inside Appalachia podcast. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.